okay, fine. This isn't Star Wars. It's Star Eater. Star Eater. But what if I told you it gave you the very similar feeling of piloting Star Destroyers and Krillian Corvettes across space, firing at each other? Yep, in Star Eater, you're manning big capital ships, trying to shoot down your opponent before they kill you. So think of any sci-fi universe, really. The Expanse, Battlestar Galactica, Red Rising, heck, even Twilight Imperium Dreadnoughts. It's big ships flying through space, using all sorts of weapons, activating thrusters in different directions, and even launching smaller ships to outmaneuver and outgun. This starship fight takes about an hour and a half for two players, but it can be played multiplayer. Let's just get into it. Quick how to play. So the goal of the game is to kill your opponent's capital ship before they kill yours, reducing their ship's health to zero. To do that, you'll want to attack them enough to destroy their armor in certain sections, then attack again to do actual damage to the ship, and get that ship HP to zero. Every turn, players first play three things face down, this engine card or wheel, then two cards from their hand of eight. The engine wheel will give your ship additional movement in that direction, and the cards will do all sorts of things. Good examples being firing a weapon or moving your capital ship again. These are all set or programmed at the same time, then you activate the engines first. Both players are going to add this selected token to their current movement. Your ship wasn't moving before here, but that won't always be the case. See, in space, ships are moving from momentum. So every time you play a token, just remember that your ship is moving in that direction for the rest of the game, until you decide to do otherwise, like deciding to go the other way to cancel that movement. So that means if we add this token here, we're gonna be moving two spaces forward every turn from now on. You can also have your engine thrusters make you rotate. And yes, you can rotate twice in one turn, every single turn. Whoa, so much clockwise turning. After the movement stuff, you activate your first program card, which will typically activate a part of your ship that you've customized. So here, you'll fire the main cannon. It shoots from the front of your ship here. If it hits, booyah, it does damage to your opponent's ship in the area of their hull. Nice. If it misses, it can launch a projectile that just hangs out on the board. And every turn, this cannon or torpedo will move forward until it hits something or flies off the map. Once both players do their first card things, then they flip over their second cards and resolve that. See how these starboard torpedoes fire from starboard on your ship? Cool stuff. Anyways, yeah, second card done for each player, that's the end of a turn. Just make sure the cards went on cooldown after playing them. Grab previously played cards or ones that have no cooldown back into your hand and start programming for the next turn. One last thing before we finish though, Corvettes. These are fighter ships that you can launch from your ship's hangars. Think of like, TIE fighters launching from a Star Destroyer. These need commands via playing the Corvette card, where you'll be telling them to do stuff based off of their specific stats. When you activate a Corvette, you can have it rotate, move through space, and fire at other Corvettes or at the prime target of your opponent's capital ship. Okay, yeah, that's Star Eater in a nutshell. First one to zero health loses the game. On to the review. Okay, pros time. So first off, the nine, yes, nine included ships look great and feel great with their thick, thick cardboard. No problem picking a ship off of appearance. Oh, cool, RNC Gilgamesh, yeah. And then you see it come alive on the space field. But let's talk about the actual game, Star Eater. And it says inertial space combat. So we gotta talk about the interesting movement it has going on. It's all about having previous ship movement orders that keep carrying over, as you keep adding on to your movement patterns. Your engine thrusts and rotations begin to compound, meaning that movement can start to get really fast if you allow it. Like, aside from trying to flank your opponent for the perfect broadside, movement is really fun when used to collide into the other ship, as ramming your opponent does damage to both players based off how much movement you had in that direction. Move real fast, do a lot of damage. And this also removes some tokens. This can allow some creative ways to move, as you can ram into your opponent's weak spot that conveniently also slows you down. In practice, the programming phase at the beginning of each turn is filled with mind games on just movement alone, as you're debating if your opponent is running away from you or coming closer. Then you're solving where your ship will end off of your current movement, and if that's something you're okay with. Remember, you can always play it safe and just negate your previous movement, so no super out of control ships if you don't want it to be that way. Plus, you can totally just keep your previous movement or play aggressive with movement because this card, Powered Engines, can get you out of a pinch. See, this is a programmable card to move your thrusters again, letting you be flexible in movement in the place of doing more damage. I wasn't just moving up because based off of your retreat, I can now flip this card and use it to get this big thrust forward. But then let's talk about the cards, the eight other cards you're programming, which we haven't talked about besides that awesome card, Power to Engines. 
See, this programming system of 8 cards is really tight and allows for some neat combos too. Yep, each player has the same exact hand of 8 cards they'll be cycling, but many of these cards correspond to their actual ship's loadout, giving character to each player's programming while still letting you see what other people are programming at a glance. Like hey, that makes the game quite easy to learn for the amount of asymmetry here. And we said you're programming two cards, where the order is extremely important, and how they combine with your engine decision that always activates first. Will you reposition and attack? Will you retreat and prepare defenses? Negate your previous clockwise rotation and emphasize moving your smaller ships? Or do you want to wait a bit before you activate those small ships? Or you can just hold your ground, and load pure cold steel into your enemy. Uh, uh, maybe we'll switch these two so the port cannons fire first. Then we have the vent coolant! Yeah, this is the holy lubricant behind all the programming for so much flexibility. Essentially, when you play it, you can reduce any card on the cooldown track by one space, which is nice to accelerate use of strong cards. But the other ability lets you take any card on cooldown that's on zero and play it on top of this vent coolant, meaning that you just get to use that grabbed card. Sweet! So this essentially just gives you a way to reach back and take exhausted cards right away, at the cost of pushing back their cooldown by a bit after the turn. Thank goodness this card exists, because without it, the programming could become a little stale as you run out of options in your hand to program as they start to go on cooldown. So now, if you want to fire your frontal cannons again, even when they're on cooldown, you technically can. Plus, it adds some more mind games, as if your opponent has some cards at zero cooldown, it still means they can reach back and use them, so you gotta be careful of that. Here's a nice combo you can do with this coolant. You program Corvettes and vent coolant in a single turn. So first Corvettes goes off, and since that has a cooldown of zero, you put it in for cooldown, and then you use vent coolant to use it again. You got to play the Corvettes card twice in one turn. That's six Corvette activations in one turn. Well, since we're giving a shout out to vent coolant, we might as well give a shout out to the Corvettes, which are a really nice supplement to the game. See, whereas capital ships are clumsy, slow to accelerate with momentum, and packed with armor, corvettes are the yin to the yang. They rotate and move on a dime, and super fragile and will die if they hit anything. Because they're so fragile, corvette positioning is really nuanced, as you weave in and out of projectiles, making sure that you're facing the right direction every turn, because all corvettes will move one space they're facing every turn. And you also have to watch out for each capital ship's point defense system, aka PDS, where if you're too close to an enemy capital ship after everything's mandatory movement, they can gun you down with their smaller guns. But wait, Admiral, you still have your main ship to worry about, so balancing the corvettes with capital ship movement is some fun tension. You're weighing between using your main batteries to fire, or playing corvettes, which lets you launch a ship out of a hangar bay, and then using that to also try to flank your enemy. Sometimes when a big gun doesn't work in their front, a nice little annoyance in their rear can do the work. Like, corvettes are special, okay? Remember, each of them matches a card, so some corvettes are incredible anti-capital ship torpedo bombers, Others can play support roles like dropping barricades around the board. Or some are like bulldozers and will help push your capital ship in a certain direction. And you've been seeing all these other tokens around the board that aren't corvettes. These are cool too. They're the projectiles that are launching from your big, hunky capital ship guns. And kind of like the corvettes, they have character. They all have different damages and firing distance that will have you carefully angling your ship to fire them, and then also to avoid your opponent's batteries. And cannons and torpedoes being projectiles that spawn on the board if they don't hit anything within range is cool. Why? Well, because they can hit something on a later turn as they complete their movement, so having your main ship or even corvettes avoid them is important. What's more is that their torpedoes have this very fitting thing where if they're not facing an enemy capital ship, they will rotate to go after one. But since it only goes in some directions, they can be fooled. Oh, and your point defense systems can kill them too if they get too close to your capital ship, but don't complete their movement for that turn, thematic again. Basically, there's three types of tokens besides your main capital ships, which each fill a niche way of attacking. Cannons will do the most damage, generally move the fastest, will mow over corvettes without a bump, but they're really simplistic as they only move in a straight line. Torpedoes usually aren't as strong or fast, can get killed by ship's defense systems, but have some homing intelligence built in. And lastly, Corvettes, they have the most flexibility, may even have some abilities used while you activate them, and won't blow up after they attack once, but they're extremely fragile and require actions to keep activating. And if you don't want to bother with tokens on the board, you can equip your ships with beams. 
which remind me of railguns, where if they hit something within the range, that's it, no projectile. And then they destroy every single other smaller token in their path. And the beams also happen to have some of the most hole affecting abilities on hit. The Corsair Beam just pushes your opponent away and gives them permanent movement. The Heat Lance Beam will shoot up to three sections on a hole, in a line, meaning that you do in fact pierce their armor into their vulnerable interior all in one attack. My goodness. And if you're wondering about the projectile abilities, there's just so many abilities I can't cover all of them, but here. There's a Dragnet Cannon that can remove your opponent's last two movement tokens. Yeah, get back here, stop running away. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, we didn't get much to the ships yet either, huh? Each of them has a special ability that is thrown to the mix. Just activate it by programming and then using this card. And these start to really dictate your strategies. Like, you can launch an EMP that will destroy every single Corvette and torpedo in front of you, range infinity and beyond. No kidding, it's the entire map in front of you. Or do a full frontal assault to launch every single weapon on your ship. Or you can just have your capital ship teleport. That's fun. And see how the capital ships all have different abilities and sizes? This isn't just everything with their uniqueness, there's more. Like, okay, look at this, you got some more well-balanced ships. Like, these look like how you'd imagine a ship to be. Strong in the front, a bit weaker in the back, and hangars located in reasonable locations. But then some ships are extreme in the front. Like, this USF Prosperity has a super chunked up frontal hole for prosperous ramming, and you always have to look at where the cannons are located. Like this RNC Diaphobus, hopefully I'm saying that right, this had me really scratching my head on how to use its starboard and port side weapons. Yeah, we can't go through all their ships and uh, all their abilities, but just know that you have nine different ships to choose from. And then, do you see all these stacks of cards here? These are ways to customize your ships after you've picked them. For every game, you can choose your ship's weapons, your point defense systems, your hangar bays, and even what type of corvettes you want to be launching and then activating. On repeat plays, you'll learn to customize ships just how you like it. Maybe you want to play a corvette heavy strategy with this wolf ship's ability and get the fastest hangar bay possible. Or you could say, I don't care about managing corvettes, I'm ramming you down, I'm gonna ram. You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> with about three cars to choose from for each weapon slot, with three different corvettes for each of the three factions, there's a lot of replay value here. And if it wasn't already pretty clear, Star Eater's gameplay meets its theme really well. You have unique ships that move differently based off their center of mass, torpedoes that can home in on enemies, corvettes that are like X-wings that fly around and do their special things, there's momentum for your bigger ship, yeah, really safe to say to feel like you're managing a proper spaceship in the heat of battle here. And then the game runs about 45 minutes per player. But um, there is no solo mode, so this game is going to be at least about an hour and a half. There is also a multiplayer mode, but um, that gets us to the cons. Okay, thought I'd kick off the cons with the multiplayer because it does feel a little out of place here. See, this isn't a game we would currently recommend for multiplayer, mostly stemming from how small this board is. With ships constantly moving and then firing stuff and then corvettes moving around, it makes sense why the board isn't too big, especially since you can collide with the edge of the board to take damage so that further speeds up games. So then once you start to add in more ships, like one more ship with their own movement patterns and then all their corvettes, the board starts to get really crowded. Things are just getting really close together here, really stifling movement options. And one of the key elements of Star Eater, the ramming of one another, just gets brutal if you're ramming one player pretty often due to the tightness, and whoever isn't getting rammed is doing super well, since they're not taking any damage while the two interlocked players hurt each other. We just didn't even want to try the 2v2 mode, because with teams, yeah, ramming would make more sense, but the board would be so crowded to just feel congested. Think about spaceship fights in, in space, right? A lot of space to move around, to maneuver and fire things. This has the exact opposite of that in multiplayer. But before getting to the rest of the gameplay cons, I thought I would talk about the rulebook, which could use some work. It tells you to get the eight command cards, you know, the ones you need to play the game, but it doesn't actually tell you what they are besides these three it talks about in the component description. 
I had to use some real deduction to look through the deck and then eventually figure out, oh, yeah, these are the eight unique ones that we should be using, which doesn't take that long to do, but still not clear at all. Plus the copies for every single player have the same back, so that definitely doesn't help. The rulebook just isn't pretty to go through, where it has just font sometimes over examples that aren't pretty. Or how this example of an armor mat doesn't actually have armor tokens set up on it, which is weird. We also really wish more in-depth examples were given for attacks, like seeing the card played and then showing the projectile movement, because it currently just has very generic examples. Also, it was very confusing how the movement token slots are purposefully misaligned with multiplayer. This threw me in for a big confusion. Turns out they have to be slightly rotated like this to keep everyone's movement consistent, but then why not just straighten out the text on the board to prevent confusion? Then the player aids are pretty good with content, but really annoying in practice to use, with two cards filled with text that are double-sided, so you have to keep flipping back and forth, back and forth during gameplay. Actually, in Star Eater as a whole, there's just some stuff that isn't really explained. Like, certain corvettes have abilities that are used in place of an attack, but that isn't said anywhere. Or how the flat cannon attacks all targets next to a certain hex, but it doesn't clarify that you always have to use this ability. Like, you would think that for a game with so many cool capital ship abilities, they would get some type of spotlight in the rulebook to clarify them, but nah, nah, unfortunately not. They're not mentioned at all all besides this little area. And you have been looking at this game so far, and yeah, it, it does look like something I'd see at like a antique store or like a dollar store. Sure, okay, that is subjective, but the janky rulebook and then the blobs of text and the player aids are not helping that. But let's talk about something that actually hurts the gameplay. Let's get to these little corvettes that can have poor clarity. These are the worst clarity in the game, since the color that matches their actual ability card is so small. Like, so small. Are, are you serious? Often during gameplay, you have to pick it up if you really want to see what card it matches, which really screws with a game that is so insistent on positioning. Like, we would really want this color to be bigger. Just make it half the token for Christ's sakes. Corvette cards are also the worst option to have small to fit this little token on your player boards since Corvettes typically have the most text and stats out of all the cards. This card really needs to be the same size as normal cards. And then a nice Corvette reference sheet to check your opponents would be nice. To wrap up the glaring component and clarity issues, the engine symbols on the wheel are so small and it's pretty much impossible to see your opponent's results, so you have to take their word for it. And then these player sheets are insanely thin and seem to be warping already? I promise you we didn't put any water on it, we just left it out and it's starting to stick up a little. As for gameplay cons, we haven't witnessed anything too crazy in our three playthroughs of this game, but there are a lot of abilities in this game. A lot of weapons, hangar abilities, even Corvette cards that aren't here. So yeah, we haven't played with all of them, but by looking through them at a glance, nothing seems too crazy. And here, Okay, I'm gonna level with you guys. I genuinely thought there was a gameplay con with the PDS systems, the point defense systems. But really, that was due to us not seeing a line in the rulebook that wasn't stressed on the player aids or the PDS cards themselves, where this line basically said, oh, you can make the PDS systems temporarily better. So yeah, the main thing for Star Eater to look out for is clarity of information, especially while learning. Okay, so we just have a couple nitpicks. The game comes with an insert, but the insert's really only good for the cards and then the cardboard ships. For the rest of the little pieces, you'll need some plastic bags to fit everything. And then there's some minor typos in the game here and then over, over here. Those parentheses are really close to the words there. And some of these plastic bits are really loose and just kind of pop out easily during gameplay but you're not really picking up the ships anyways, so not, not a huge deal. The nitpick that really stood out to me was a missed chance to flesh out this world of Star Eater with the three factions that do exist in the game, but don't get much backstory. Yep, you got the yellow, blue, and red, or Lamus, FPA, and Uniset. But I mean, why aren't these names on the actual ships? 
or how there's a backstory for actual ships, weapons, or corvettes in the back of the rulebook, including this toilet roll core, but doesn't have a lore area for each of the actual factions. We really bring this up because you have all these different types of ships with unique attributes. So by knowing the backstory for each faction, that could help players even more easily pick a strategy. Like think of watching Star Wars and then playing a Star Wars themed game and going like, oh, I want to hit fast and hard and am okay being outgunned. Well, if I play the Rebels, I can use the X-Wing that can move really fast and fly around the Death Star. That's the massively popular Star Wars and not Star Eater. So yeah, of course there's not a perfect once one with this indie game, but I think you get the point. Giving big ships some history really helps you get into and understand the game. And this game is kind of doing that with some of the lore here, but it's so minimal. It's so minimal right now. Now it's time for a recommender score on Star Eater, where we try to critically evaluate the pros and cons, and then also evaluate whether or not this is even a good idea in the first place. And so, Star Eater is going to get a 7 out of 10 from us. It is good. There's a lot in here, and it's not just whatever content. The gameplay lives up to be nicely asymmetric, clever, and overall great. If Star Eater is saying it's inertial space combat, it definitely feels that way as you worry about moving your ship's thrusters in different ways, playing off of both players, or should I say Admiral's, movements. And this movement system has tons of bells and whistles with ways to deck out your ship, or swap out supplementary corvettes, all while gameplay be centered around three things. One engine program, and two action cards. How is he moving and attacking, and how should I respond to all of that with all these weapon options? And like, yeah, admittedly, some of the visual design is not really helping it here, but that is subjective, and the only area where the visual design really hurts it is the Corvettes, because that actually messes with gameplay. Let's do a fun thought experiment. Let's say that this game was published by a big, big publisher. Then it would be a base game price that would be like $40, and you would have it packaged with three ships instead of nine. Way less cards to customize with, unless you buy expansions for more ships and cards. And then to give you motivation to buy and keep expanding your game, the game would be filled with amazing art, backstories for each ship, and clear factions you can start associating yourself with. Think of deciding to play a certain type of color deck in Magic the Gathering, or getting a certain type of army in Warhammer 40k. Yeah, Star Eater feels so so indie in having factions, but not really fleshing them out, so there's not a big enticing hook for the spaceship fighting you're doing. This is probably due to budget constraints, but it just mostly has a skirt on its mechanics right now, the inertial combat mechanics, which are great. But those mechanics can go unseen if Star Eater never gets played, which uh, I guess is why we're here to talk about how good it is. And look at this, the designer put his username 5 volt on the box, if you still had doubts whether or not this was indie. Oh wait, hold on. Star Eater could have gone in the same direction as Star Wars X-Wing, made by a big publisher. Luckily, we have played X-Wing a couple times many years ago we used to own it, so here's a quick comparison. Star Eater's map with momentum movement really sets it apart to not need rulers, and it promotes more collisions. Plus, Star Eater asks for way more management with Corvettes, which are basically your X-Wings you're talking to from Command Control here. Star Eater is certainly more complicated, but you can be a lot more precise with the hex movement, and it's a lot more financially lenient on your wallet. Star Wars, on your mind or not, Star Eater gameplay is an awesome premise that will appeal to most sci-fi fans. Its gameplay is not only tense and promotes creativity, but feels like you're in a sci-fi ship. Star Eater also does kind of weirdly shy away from world building, so in its current state, you can just easily insert your own sci-fi universe over it. So, if you've ever wanted to feel like you need to fire thrusters to prevent from overturning, while launching corvettes out of your hangar bay, all while praying for your homing torpedoes to hit their mark on special ships, Star Eater could be a customizable dueler win for you, if you're okay with some jank. My personal score for Star Eater is going to be a 7 out of 10. I have a good time with it. So I was a little surprised because I generally don't like programming in games, uh, Gloomhaven comes to mind. But I found that programming works really well for this premise where there's two big hulking capital ships that need orders from an admiral at the top. So then you're programming or giving orders to have your ship move certain thrusters or set certain weapons to fire from certain locations from your ship. Very cool. All these different weapon banks to think about. 
The funny thing is the theme though, which befuddles me as it's a melting pot of vastly different sci-fi in my head. I'm hilariously getting Star Fox vibes from all the ships, mixed in with a little bit of this personally 10 out of 10 OG video game, Treasure Planet Battle at Procyon. This is also a game where you fly ships through space and launch torpedoes and broadsides, and so seeing I could do that all in person in Star Eater was super engaging. Needless to say, my mind is passing through Star Fox weapons, Treasure Planet capital ships, Star Wars X-Wings, and the Expanse PDS systems. Let's get to the gameplay though, which I thought wouldn't be too up my alley. There's some bookkeeping to do with projectiles to keep track of, and then you have to worry about your constantly momentous movement, and then so you have to keep canceling it sometimes. These initially sounded like chores to me, but they weren't. Yeah, even though there's a lot of moving parts, the game ended up feeling extraordinarily clean and tense. And so I have to commend the overall structure of the game. It's just programming three things, one, two, three, and then all the projectiles just move in a straight line. So they're fairly easy to keep track of. There is a fun mind game every turn of where exactly your opponent is moving and firing, which is fun to mull over, but that programming guessing gets too crowded in multiplayer, which in addition to making the game feel needlessly long, is why I never want to play that again. But in the 1v1, the vent coolant, power to engines, and corvette movement were the icing on top of the tense programming. The existence of these cards made programming less rigid, giving me more flexibility to react to my opponents. Corvette movement and vent coolant were my favorites to use in case I messed up, balancing out the traditional means to attacking, so that you can have really satisfying turns which feel balanced between programming and adapting. Like, I can move my ship all the way around like this in one turn for a high risk, high reward broadside, if it works. Man, playing around with all the epic sounding weapons is just so fun. There is something very primal about scoring a ridiculously strong main cannon hit, or a massive broadside with multiple batteries. And then it's hilariously imagination provoking when it happens to you and your ship gets shredded and you can imagine the chaos on your ship. Ramming is also primal feeling and can lead to sudden sources of damage across multiple areas of your holes, which can make endgame really tense. In fact, I had an awesome story of where I thought I had the guaranteed win, but my buddy kept ramming me and I was pinned against the corner of the board. And only by the speed of one card I managed to win by having my Corvette launch a torpedo into his backside. I can see a lot more tense, imaginative stories coming out of this. But then why is it just a 7 out of 10? Well, the game is a little too long for me for what it is for not having any progression. Because remember, you're still programming from a hand of 8 and you're only doing 3 things every single turn. So I would have wanted the game shaved off by about 30 minutes or so. Star Eater also feels a very weird time slot for me at 1.5 hours for 2 players. It's slightly too long for me to just casually whip it out and play it 1v1, and it's nowhere near epic enough to fill an epic 1v1 slot like a Star Wars Rebellion. Then the Corvette abilities, these feel like overload to me. They are all cool in isolation, but man, with your Corvette abilities and then your opponents, then all sorts of weapons and capital ship abilities, I tend to just tune out my opponent Corvette abilities. And this is very helped by the fact that it's just so hard to keep track of what they do and their colors. Gah! So what I would personally want is for each ship to have the health shaved off by about a third or so, and then have each player limited to two Corvette abilities at max, with simpler Corvette abilities in general, and then also just a facelifted visual design with the Corvettes. And the game board does hurt my eyes, so I'd want that fixed. Oh, and then while we're at it, just take out evasion and accuracy from the game. If you want some ships and torpedoes to be better at dodging, just make that a keyword and require more hits to kill them or something. I'd very much want to play it again, especially if there's a facelifted second edition. And that might be an 8 out of 10 for me. It might be 8 out of 10. So yeah, let's see if we can get a second edition of Star Eater. Star Eater being sent to us did not affect scoring. And as always, thank you to our patrons at patreon.com slash shelf shelf slash Shelfside, patreon.com slash shelfside. Yep. Uh, also, check out our website. There should be a review for that there. I'll put it in the description below. We also got merch. So, yeah, all cool stuff. Anyways, uh, Patreon names. We're going. We also got our Mad Lads of Cardboard. We'll put that over there, too. Mad Lady of Cardboard over there. And yeah, remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think about this game. I think it is pretty darn fun. Anyways, 
See you guys. Bye-bye.